you're here at uh, a Think and Link event. We do these uh, once a week now, and um, we have some amazing guests this week. Um, we do uh, this adapted from an event we put on in our office uh, that we started in the last recession, and we started this because we wanted to give a place for people to network and connect um, in a recession to find new opportunities, new jobs, new uh, people to meet, um, and a friendly face. Um, so when we did that um, and kept that going um, through to now and moving this to an online event in which we have our two guests and then we do a little bit of a small group discussion after, um, it's our way of, of giving back to our community in any way we can, helping people connect because there are somewhere, somewhere in the millions and millions, 10 million, 20 million, so many people unemployed right now. So um, we need to do whatever we can, each of us, to get them back to work. So Capsule, um, we are, we refer to ourselves as a special projects firm. Uh, we're here in um, Minneapolis and we work on a variety of interesting special projects um, in and around brand, um, design, packaging, related work and digital um, stuff in all forms. Um, and doing that, we've actually been able to work with both of these gentlemen um, on different types of projects. Uh, they've been great clients. And the big news we have, which Kelly can elaborate on as well, is that Capsule put itself through its own process, performed surgery on itself. And I can tell you, and all of you have tried this before to do your own rebrand of yourself, it is about the most painful thing you can possibly do. I actually considered halfway through it, um, consider the idea of going on hiring a firm like us to do our own work because it was at one point very painful and, and not getting done. Um, but we got there and uh, we have a new website, a new, uh, bunch of wonderful messaging work done and all kinds of stuff coming up that you'll love. So I implore you to go visit those things, see what we're doing. So um, again, um, audio off. Uh, video on so we can see everybody we are recording and this may show up in the world so anybody walking behind you and doing strange things it is thinking like pants optional but we don't say that's a recommendation we just say that's a little bit of a funny uh, <laughs> comments and questions in the chat we'll try to answer them as we can as we go into this um, so and if for for introduction sake um, if you don't know or haven't heard of Moral Percini uh, and James Damien. Uh, Moro um, was here in Minnesota um, working for 3M as head of design. That's where I met him. And um, we actually did a speech together way back when in the Summit Brewery space. Uh, it was fantastic. It was amazing. And I invited him to go speak at Think and Link when you know we had it here in the office. Uh, and he said yes. And then he got an offer from Pepsi and it was in New York. Well, there it goes. So we didn't get to get him in, but he's back now. And he's in a car, yes, because there's a whole story with that that we don't need to get into, but it's funny. <laughs> okay. um, James, <laughs> and then and then James, the gentleman of design, um, the gentleman's gentleman, um, is uh, is here, uh, formerly head of um, design in Best Buy, um, and has been an amazing icon in design, an elegant voice in design. Um, and someone that you can't help but want to listen to. And he doesn't even have the Italian accent to go with him. He has to work with the American accent, and he's still, you'll want to listen all day long. So um, those are our two guests. Um, we're going to go into questions, um, and I'm going to throw out the big, nice, easy softball one for both of you to um, talk about what inspires you in design in general. What are the things, and Marl, if you want to start us off, Get us going with what inspires you about design. Well, uh, Aaron, first, thanks for the invite and hi everybody. I see a few familiar faces from from PepsiCo, from 3M, and other people from my life back in Minnesota. Uh, so, what inspires me of design? I think uh, there are many things, but something that is really, really important for me is the connection with people. Is, is, you know, this possibility, this opportunity of spending your life 24-7 analyzing people, analyzing what they want, what they dream, what they need, and trying to find solutions to make their life better, to make their life easier, more convenient, more fun, 
I mean, and, and it's not just about, you know, the analysis, but then it's really the translation of those insights, what you learn into the creation of something that makes sense for them. It's a job that is fantastic because we are here creating value for the society in so many different ways. And, and this is really inspiring. We're lucky. I love that. I love that. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. James. James, your perspective. Well said, Mauro. Um, I agree with everything that you just said. I would add that for me, um, my entry into the design world was through the arts. And I grew up in Philadelphia, and my mother was a historian. And just the stories of how things were created. Um, during a time when America was just starting out, that plus music were my sources of inspiration. And the more that I, I studied music, um, I majored in conducting at first, uh, that showed me um, an, a metaphor for leadership. And um, then I transferred to design school in New York City. But the thing that really inspired me about design was that it enabled me to have a voice, an expression. My background's in exhibition design. And the stage of New York City was so exciting to me. And the people in it. Because design is about diversity, diversity of thought and everything that makes us different. And uh, to be welcomed into that open community was just uh, the greatest thing that could have happened to me because it was unexpected. Um, and design does do great things. Um, let's face it, we were given this planet but everything else on the planet was designed. Design is everything. Um, sometimes we're unconscious about it. We take it for granted. But design is an inspiration. And the people that I met in New York at that time, uh, growing up in department stores in New York City, where they were the biggest stages for theater, and uh, Windows allowed me to express myself and write myself into that story. And from there, uh, it was the mentors that I met along the way that um, actually validated that, James, this is the right place for you. That's great. I, before we get to your question, Kelly, because I do I want to get to your big meaty questions, which are really good. Um, I do want to give James the opportunity because he just described the going from a window designer in New York to the story of, of Best Buy going into Apple and all that went down in that event. If you don't mind sharing that story, James, um, that's been a, a really good inspiration for two large organizations interacting and the importance of design in one of those at least. I'd love for you to tell the Apple story. Sure. Um, I uh, was recruited by a CEO that I most admired, uh, Brad Anderson, who was uh, heading up Best Buy. And I left New York to come to Best Buy. And what he said to me uh, is that, James, um, your biggest battle will be the culture. And um, that, that will mean that the culture's natural tendency is to chew you up and spit you out and send you back to New York. That's going to happen. But that's why we need you. And you, are, you have to build a design uh, capability inside this organization if we're going to grow and develop. Now, Best Buy at that time only had 275 stores. It was barely making any money off of $7 billion at the time in sales. That's how bad it was. And um, it was Anderson that knew he had to recruit uh, different voices and build different capabilities if they were going to survive. So um, 
after my first, I guess, five years of building new concepts and hitting the ground running, um, Apple um, said to Brad, you're the last man standing. And the reason we went into retail is because we hate the way people present our products. And you're the only company right now that's left that has a chance of doing service to people that want to buy Apple products mm -hmm. in a mass specialty arena. So we're going to give you a shot. And they invited everybody to go out, but Brad couldn't make it. So he sent the chief merchant out to Cupertino. And at the table were all the Apple executives and they went through, they went through introductions. And um, then it was turned over to Best Buy to go through their introductions. And as they did so, uh, and when they finished, Mr. Jobs asked our chief merchant, so where's your design leader? And uh, he actually responded in the worst possible way and said, we'll bring design in when we need them. And Steve Jobs got up from the table and he said, this meeting is over. You guys just don't get it, which proves my point. This is why we went into retail. And if we're going to do business with you, if we're going to do business with you, you better have your design leader and you better work with us on building a retail experience our way, not your way. And uh, I got a call that evening from the merchant and said, James, uh, you know, I made the biggest mistake. And I know that you <laughs> suggested that, I, that you should be there and it's my fault. And I need you to get on the next plane to Cupertino. And that's where, um, you know, just sitting there and listening to Jobs and all of his people talk about design and customer experience uh, was like, you know, such a validation and it couldn't have been a greater gift because we went on to do greater things and we went through a period of extraordinary growth. But sometimes it takes that validation from the outside. Sometimes you need help. You need an advocate. You need a sponsor. And I know Morrow had one uh, with a great leader in Indra. So we share that um, and uh, I couldn't be more grateful. Uh, let me well, let me connect to that uh, because I have a Steve Jobs story too, and then and there's an Indra Nui story uh, connected to the one of Steve. Uh, Steve and Indra talked a few years ago. Uh, Indra Nui, for the for anybody that doesn't know, was is the former CEO of PepsiCo that hired me into PepsiCo, and it's actually Steve Jobs that told Indra Nui early on when she just became CEO, she was coming from finance and strategies, she was the CFO of the company. She told her, if you're serious about branding and consumer centricity and, and innovation, you need design in the company. And she always, always talked about this. It's impressive how the man and the company either directly, like in this Best Buy story or in, in this PepsiCo story, or indirectly by showing that design can really drive business, you know, and, and not just, you know, sales and revenue, but also your stock. Uh, it, it's amazing how it's been influencing so many companies and people all around the world. And I, I think it's also interesting how a business person, not a designer, but a business person was able to influence other business people around the world uh, on the importance of design. In many, I remember when I was at 3M, I, would, I used to organize these conferences where I would bring in business people, not designers, but business people, talking to business people about how they've been leveraging design. It's extremely powerful as a, as a strategy to build culture of design. And then connecting to what you said at the very beginning, James, about culture, I think the, the real job of a CDO, of a chief design officer, but it could be the one of a big corporation 
or, or the one of a small startup, anybody leading design, you know, a small team, an agency uh, in connection with a customer. Uh, the real job before anything else is a meta project, is the meta project of designing culture and using our tools, you know, what some, somebody called design thinking, you know, you can call it whatever you want, is our way of thinking and operating of designers, this connection between empathy, understanding the people we have in front of us, what we need to do for that company and for our consumers, strategy that is really understanding the business model of the company, the processes and the culture of the company, and then you start to prototype. But in this case, instead of prototyping a product or a packaging or a brand, you prototype organizations. You know, if I think about the, the, the design organization of PepsiCo, we have today 15 design centers around the world. We have different kinds of tiers for each of them, different kinds of capabilities in each of them. But we made our mistakes. We made our prototypes. I don't like to call them mistakes because in reality, they are experiments and prototypes and they were part of the big project of creation of culture and organization inside a big company that is, you know, is one of the most wicked problem you can imagine <laughs> uh, for a designer. It, it's fascinating. Then the projects plug into this, but it's something much bigger than that. I think uh, just to uh, draft off of that, um, one of the things that I'm doing right now with Grotini in Italy is transformational work. And that's really my passion right now. Having spent time at sea level and being chairman of a public company, I know where the root cause of problems exist. And in big companies, they're usually existing within the board and at the sea level. So as a right brain ambassador in the left brain world of business, which has been my calling my entire career, I believe that things need to start first with culture prior to strategy. Peter Drucker once said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And understanding and doing cultural emergence, immersion first is the gateway to better understanding the behaviors of the people their attitudes that live within the organization. And if you don't walk in their shoes, Morrow mentioned empathy. Empathy is the first phase of the design thinking method. And that means that you really have to listen. You have to be a student. It's almost like uh, an archeological dig to understand what those behaviors are all about so that design can design to the behaviors, just like the pandemic that we're in right now. I think it's the greatest calling and the greatest opportunity for design to really embrace how do we solve these problems, but you have to first understand what these new behaviors are. And I'll, I'll just end it with this quote that, that I keep on my desk. And it's from Oliver Wendell Holmes. People are always talking about, we're gonna get back to the uh, business as usual, uh, being normal again. Well, that's not going to happen. These events change our lives forever. And um, Holmes said this, one's mind once stretched by a new idea never regains its original dimensions. And that's the space that we're living in right now. And it's up to design to really solve these issues and problems. And the work that I'm doing at Grotini is about transformational culture. And if you start there first, just like we have to start now in this pandemic, we have to start first with that. By understanding culture, it helps you define what the real issues are that you're trying to solve. And that's what design is all about. It's about communication, but more importantly, I think it's about sincerity. And of course, it's always about problem solving. And this is our time. 
James, uh, I know you. There are questions, but no, this is great. Please, we don't need to use questions. <laughs> this you is great. That, you say that the problem of, of companies, big and small, starts with the with a board, with executive team. Uh, you need you need to work on the culture there. I agree, but there is also there is also another side, and I'm curious to hear if you agree with me or not. Um, sooner or later you will convince the CEO, the board level, uh, most of the time because they have the luxury to dream, to think big. You know, they, if, you have the, if you have the CEO of 3M, the CEO of PepsiCo, the CEO of Best Buy, come on, I mean, you are there to think big. That's what everybody's asking you. Then you need also to execute and to manage the day to day, but, but you have the luxury. And usually at that level, they have the luxury. So sooner or later, if you, if you are convincing, you will, you will show them the way and they will buy into that. Then at the, at the entry level of the company, so usually the younger generations, they get it too because they want the change, they see the way, they, they understand what's going on, they don't understand the, you know, often they don't understand the risk implied in certain changes and they're very excited by doing something different. My, my biggest difficulty in all these years has been in the middle of the company. And the middle is the, you know, those people have been in the company for 20 years. They've been very successful at doing certain things in a certain way. Uh, that know that if they don't screw up, you know, in one or two years, they will move to the next job. Uh, and that taking risk instead could, could create a major problem for them, but not just for their career. But imagine if you lose your job, that, that has an impact on, on your personal life, on the education of your kids, on, on anything, right? So it's, it's a real risk. It's a tangible, concrete risk. And so, you know, my strategy in that part of the organization has been the one of finding people that somehow are wired in a different way. I call them the co-conspirators. Co-conspirator, they are people that, you know, there is something wrong with them and they want to take a risk because it's not normal. You know, we're designed as human beings. I mean, it's, nature is designed in the way. It's designed to preserve inertia. You know, to preserve the energy of the system, you don't need to put any, any energy in that. And there is this constant movement. And to change the movement, you need to put energy. That translated in our world is in the human uh, speech is word is sacrifice is is effort is risk so there are few people that are willing to do something like this and 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 risk big and so i try to find them inside the organization with the chart in pepsico i learned that in 3m and then i went to pepsico and, and i had my playbook so with the chart in pepsico we started to map the co-conspirators and it's very important to find them because with them you, you have uh, the possibility to move things very fast in a very efficient way. You don't need, you don't need to lose time convincing them or, 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 or fighting their lack of awareness about what you're trying to do. You risk together, you bet together. We, and with them, then you build the, what I call the proof points. You start to create something that everybody can see that is tangible, they show the value of design. At that point, other people in the middle management of the organization, they will be like, well, mm, interesting. I would like to try too. And then at that point, they're like, okay, give me the money, give me the resources, and we can try with you as well. I've been growing designing PepsiCo from zero people to 250 people today and growing with this kind of strategy, proof point after proof point, co-conspirator after co-conspirator, with the supervision, the protection, the sponsorship of somebody at the top that I needed to convince first, or in the case of Indra, she was already convinced about the overall value. But then you, you also need to convince the people uh, about the value in the day-to-day, -day, the integration with the rest of the organization. You need to give the ammunition to a CEO that believe in you to defend you in front of the rest of the executives, in front of the board, in front of the shareholders. So it's very important every time to prove the value of what you're doing and, and landing proof points, landing projects that can show the value, even if they're not perfect, is very, very powerful to be the culture. Finding co-conspirators, allies in marketing, in R&D, in consumer insights, in legal, in all the different functions is key to drive that kind of awareness. I see that you don't have a lot of passion for that. <laughs> Inspired. Just, yeah. I know. <laughs> wow. may, may I just uh, have a short moment? James, please. On yes. That? yes. 
Um, I, I wholeheartedly agree about the co-conspirators in the organization. But as you look at the ecosystem of companies, the majority of companies out there today are handcuffed by their own orthodoxies, especially because of this digital era. And I'll speak to any company that serves a customer because if they are there to serve a customer, the most important thing in serving a customer is the employee. And leaders must embrace the human dignity of every employee. That happened to me and I felt so good. So the leader's job is to embrace the dignity of the worker. And if you take care of your employees, the customers will be served. And then the shareholders will get their value, not the other way around. And I believe that the majority of companies today stuck in this um, situation, almost paralyzed, not knowing what to do, are the companies that are going to fall away. Why? Because the biggest enemy is complacency. And I'll say this about the board and the CEOs in a general way. We've had the good fortune to work for great leaders. There aren't a lot of them out there. And the board and the CEOs are furthest away from the customer. So one of the things that I inaugurated, not only at Best Buy, but with every board member at Buffalo Wild Wings, is that they had to walk in the shoes of the employees and the customers to feel their pain. I'm more interested as a designer to understand what those pain points are so that the objective facilitation of design can really address those things. I'll give you one example. I was looking for seed money to develop new concepts for women at Best Buy because I did video testimonials on the road and I asked women what they liked and what they disliked. But I framed it under the question, tell me what you hate most about Best Buy. And they unleashed hell. And I captured it on video. And I used that as my sword and my shield to go back to the board and say, do you realize that you are not inviting half of the population of the world to your stores? You're a company that are audiophiles that a man had passion for, hired other men, and built a store for men. And yet the biggest decision makers in the households are women. 87% of the transactions have to go through her. And yet we weren't inviting them. And that's how I got my seed money to do Studio D which was a concept about sharing memories and the head of household, which are women and their friends. So that's my crusade to get into these kinds of companies and help them think differently and not to be afraid of things, but to embrace change. And that's the hardest thing. That is the hardest thing, especially for leaders that have been somewhat successful. So I think that's the crusade of design, not just in spaces like that, but look at what's happening in the world. And we are responsible for stepping up and we've got to convince those leaders that now is the time to change and to embrace design thinking. Well, you say something and I'm gonna link it back to the period we are in now. You say, especially for the leaders that are successful. This is so true. You know, for leaders and for companies, if you are in a success phase, if you're doing well, if your business is going well, 
it's so incredibly difficult to, first of all, to change, but mostly to innovate. Even if your industry is going in a different direction, but if you are stable, even if you know that things are gonna change in the future, if you are stable, it's tough. Because every company, being a small, but especially a big one, are built on efficiency, on productivity. You know, innovation is totally inefficient by definition, always. And then you build efficiency once you have something valuable for people, for consumers, for the society. So once you have that efficiency, it's very difficult to break that efficiency, you know, by driving innovation. Uh, financially means that you're impacting your profitability as a company, your, your bottom line. So it's extremely, extremely difficult. And that's why, you know, we, I've been in many conversations in, in the past few weeks, uh, you know, during this pandemic. And a lot of people are asking me, well, how do you see this pandemic? And, you know, what's, what do you see next? And I think, you know, we are in a moment of major crisis for our society. You know, we are... Uh, putting everything, uh, we are looking at everything with different eyes. We are reprioritizing what is important in life and in companies. We are trying to understand what will be next. And even people that are already an idea, a vision of change, they really wanted to change, are finding in this moment an opportunity to finally drive that change. You know, there is almost an alibi. Well, there is this crisis. Let's do what I was thinking about for a while. You know, I don't know if you saw... Uh, the uh, the double announcement of uh, George Armani in the past few weeks. Yes. Uh, the first one was a challenge to the entire fashion industry, to the seasonalities. Uh, he told the world, well, my collections uh, are going to stay in the stores uh, um, all the way until September. Usually in the summer, you will find the winter collections. Instead, it was like, no, I'm going to change. You know, the rhythm is unsustainable for the environment, for our employees, for society, for everybody, it makes no sense. It's the, and, and it's interesting because he said that, and you have to see the reaction of people from designers to the productions and the factories, to the media, uh, to the retailers, everybody in agreement. So who was driving this, this, you know, this inhuman pace of life? And then recently he announced that he's moving Alta Moda, you know, the high fashion show from Paris to Milan for a variety of reasons to help the country, but also because traveling all, you know, everybody from Italy to go to Paris, why? He talked about the fact that you have all these shows all around the world, why? Uh, why do you have even shows? So I'm mentioning Armani, why? Because this is something that he felt for a while, but yet he never had the possibility, and he talked about it in the past, but he never had the possibility to stop the machine. And right now he took this occasion because anyway, the system is in crisis. Anyway, he was not able to produce his collection. He was producing masks and vests for, for the health care workers in Italy. He couldn't produce it anyway, but he said, I'm not going to, produce this collection, but I'm not going to do it again. You know, I'm going to break down uh, that machine. And this Sonora now followed. So I'm mentioning this for two reasons. One, uh, I think in this moment of crisis, we have an opportunity to drive change. We have an opportunity to innovate in so many different ways, in the way we work, in the, in the products we produce, in, in the politics, in, in society, in so many uh, different fields and, and, and ways. And that's really something uh, amazing that, that, you know, this pandemic, you know, with all the bad uh, and, the, and the tragedy that it's bringing, uh, is giving us. I don't remember the second one, it will come. <laughs> I had it in mind. <laughs> Very transparently, I was taken by the first one. Now this, this is great. And, and I'm going to be the first to say, I don't know that we're going to get to breakout rooms today because we want to keep this conversation going. I'm hearing a lot of chatter, a lot of great questions coming from the audience. So, James Morrow, if we can keep you as, you know, as long as we can for the next half hour, we'd love to do that. Um, I have a couple of questions I would love to ask, and I, I know we have some from the audience. Um, really staying in the vein of innovation, um, the need for organizations, um, and certainly designers, the role they play in agile innovation and moving quickly. Um, Mara, you specifically uh, spoken on a number of occasions about the importance of design in the world, in the world, in the world of business, and really the idea that people don't 
just buy products anymore. They're, and you, you've, you've spoken to this already this morning, they're looking for holistic solutions to their problems and they want meaningful experiences and they, it, brands need to tell their stories authentically and, and thus designers need to create extraordinary content to cut through the clutter um, because barriers to the marketplace are low or have been. Um, and you've also spoken about some of the drivers and trends that you've seen in the last year or so that are presenting challenges or really the hurdles that designers and innovators are seeing um, in delivering these experiences in authentic ways. Can you speak to that? And then I'll add to that, in light of the pandemic, are you seeing a shift in some of those trends um, that, that may impact, again, how designers and innovators create content? Well, look, the challenges that have been seen in the past few years are challenges that have been there for a while. Uh, essentially, as I said earlier, these companies are driven by efficiency. Efficiency in their business models and efficiency in the way they produce, they manufacture, and in any kind of process they have inside the organization. And, and therefore, they were prioritizing systems where you had barrier to entry, of, of multiple kinds, driven by technology and patents, driven by scale and therefore by distribution and relation with certain kind of customers, driven by the scale of media buying and what you, you know, the, the ability to buy the, uh, the opportunity, the power, the right to talk to people. So it was very difficult for anybody to go and compete with these companies in the past. Today, you can find it's really easy to uh, get access to funding uh, through sites like kickstarter.com or through the proliferation of BC and funds that are hunting for ideas all around the world. Um, the cost of manufacturing is going down, uh, driven by new technologies and new technologies like 3D printing, for instance, will take it even further down. Uh, you can go straight to consumers with e-commerce and you build your ecosystem of communication through social media. So this is creating a situation where any of us, you know, there are 117 people connected right now. Any of you today can come up with an idea and go against Procter & Gamble, Pepsi, PepsiCo, Coca-Cola, any big corporation with a product. And you can sell directly, you know, through e-commerce and communicate through your social media. So this is creating a situation where Either you create something extraordinary for people or somebody else will do it for you. You cannot protect mediocrity anymore with your barrier to entry. There is no way. And what do, you know, I know that right now there are millions and millions of people out there trying to understand how to take down uh, my products, my brands. They're, and they're very smart people and they will find a way to do it. So, you know, to live in the illusion that our industry will stay as it is in the next few years is actually just a naive illusion. It will change. We saw what happened with Uber and transportation, with Airbnb and hospitality. It's gonna happen essentially in all the industries. So once again, what those people are doing out there? What are they thinking? Well, they're observing other people and they're trying to understand what are the frustrations? What are those unmet needs and wants and desires? In many, in many ways, not just in the product, maybe it's in the service, in the experience in retail, in distribution, in many different ways. And it's enough that you have one weakness, one weakness, and that's the gate where they will get in. And so this is beautiful, it's fantastic, because it means that for the first time in history, in history, any company of the world, big or small, needs to put the needs and the desire of people before anything else, before technology, before business, before brands, before revenue. Actually, if you put human beings in front of everything, you will generate revenue, you will build brands. Technologies are enablers, are amplifiers, but they need to be treated in that way. You cannot look at technology as something that you patent and it will, it will protect you from others, even if you don't have the ideal solution for people. So it's a, it's a magic world. And I think what's going on right now with the pandemic, this pandemic is accelerating some of these mm -hmm. trends that were already starting. Mm -hmm. Essentially, more than ever, we are realizing that, you know, we have specific needs and wants that we need to fulfill. You know, uh, we were probably moving too fast. The pace of life, the pace of the economy, it was not okay. Uh, we were totally unrespectful of the environment. And we are realizing that the planet can sneeze 
and get rid of us in a second. And this is a warning. Right now, they are sneezing and it's not getting rid of us. But it could. In a moment, it could happen. So maybe we should start to respect the environment we are in and, and live in, in synergy with an environment. Uh, so the, this trend of humanization, I think, is going to be accelerated in, in many different ways. Uh, if you think about sustainability, if you think about health and wellness, right now we are realizing that the, bad, the healthier you are, the more protected you are from this virus. So we know that in food and beverage and also in other industries, health and wellness will be a trend that will be accelerated. But it was already starting. We as PepsiCo were already investing billions of dollars in, in, the, in, the, in that area. There are others, though, that I don't know if they will accelerate. And, and for instance, I talk about the pace of life. There is a moment of awareness. We know that we should slow, we should slow down. But the reality is that the system, you know, this was not a trend. The trend, uh, sustainability, health and wellness were trend, they were growing. And so this is going to accelerate those trends. The pace of life was actually accelerating, was not slowing down. Mm -hmm. So it, it, that was the trend, the acceleration. If we're not slowing down, right now we are, and we're all awareness, and we're all in empathy and in love, and we get it. The reality is that as soon as this virus is over, everything will default back to the situation before in that, in that area. We'll move back to that speed. Unless, unless you have leaders around the world business leaders, political leaders, and influencers, they set a different direction. And that's why I mentioned Armani. Unless somebody has the courage to say, no, enough, I'm going to do something different. And then maybe another company, we, if it's on Iran in the case of fashion, follow. And then another one, follow. There are many companies, eventually, they would like to do it, but they don't have the credibility, the courage to do it. But if a leader does, then you follow through. So this is a moment where we need leaders more than ever. We need leaders to identify opportunities that eventually were not already part of the society before and drive those opportunities um, in the right way to change the society for the better. Wow. <laughs> can, I, uh, can I respond to that, yes, please, Kelly? Please, please. Okay. Um, there's nothing like a good crisis to wake us up. And I hope this time it awakens all of the goodness that lives within the human condition. Design is about the human condition. And everybody that's out there, your entrepreneurs, your business leaders out there in the audience, you're helping other companies to think differently. This is our time to do the things that were trending only at a more accelerated uh, manner. One of the great leaders in the world on this cause, which is the humanity of capitalism, is a man named Brunello Cuccinelli. Please Google him. Read his recent letter to the world about this crisis. It will inspire you. Also, my advice to everybody in the audience. So how do we go about this? Well, the first thing that I would say, embrace your employees. Understand what's on their mind. Inquire. Develop your own philosophy. If you don't have a philosophy, you don't have a true north, and you can't solve these major problems that faces society today. And what are these trends? I believe that um, the philosophy we created at Grotini, which I'll, I'll share with you, it took us some time but we were not going to leave the station until we had a stand, a philosophy that everybody could write themselves into. And we came up with this. We believe in a humanistic culture. We create places to benefit human relations. We serve 
sustainable progress through human-centric design. That philosophy, there isn't anything that we do today that doesn't start with that. And if, it, if everything that we do or try to solve within the company or for our clients doesn't have those three stands in it, then we're off the tracks. Everybody needs a compass. And today, this is not about technology leading us, which I agree with Moro wholeheartedly. It's our humanity that leads us. Technology is a tool that enables the human experience. And isn't that why we're all here in the first place? We are here to love ourselves first so that we can love others. Design is about love. It's about care. It's about sincerity. And it is an objective facilitator in the world of solving problems. Let's face it, we created this mess. We also created the incredible innovation that we've seen in the world. Man can be destructive, but man, I believe, is more creative than destructive. And this is a problem that we all have to solve. So how does that translate in, in our world? We're going to have to look at all of these new behaviors because they're not going away. We have to design to them. So public spaces become the epicenter of everything that we do. So how do we do it in a more curated manner? That's more about the old town square where all of the things of needs and desires are placed together in a smaller, more curated space. These are the things that enable human relations, which is why at Grotini we created this concept called Agora, the old Greek, which means a place to gather. And in the Greek times, these squares were prominent, where people could go to the square, express themselves, debate, politics, life, whatever it was. We need an agora in this world. You say something, you use the word love, and I was looking at the chat and people caught it and they really like it. You know, I'm writing a book and the title will be People in Love with People. And, and, and this is the way I define designers, people in love with people. And he came to me many years ago. I was still at 3M, in 3M in Italy, and it was the year of the customer satisfaction. And I remember I was like, well, what's the difference between satisfaction and love? You know, if you want to satisfy somebody, you try to do everything, you know, to fulfill a specific need and you will satisfy the person. But if you love somebody, it could be your kids, your wife, your husband, your parents, you try to do more. You try the magic, the unexpected, you try to surprise them, it's poetry. And, and this is what we do as designers. This is what we mean we love. It's going above and behind. When people expect something, you're gonna do much more than that. When we talk about, you know, unbelievable, engaging, meaningful experiences. This is what design is about. It's not about satisfaction. And by the way, it's about people. There is a word that, you know, sometimes I use just to be understood, but that I really hate. It is the word consumer. I love to call people people, human beings. They're people, they're not consumers. I don't like consumers for two reasons. One, because it implies the idea of consuming in a society where one of our biggest problem is the scarcity of resources. We should reuse, not consume, you know? And then the second is that immediately you look at people as a business entity, you know? The entity you wanna make money on, you wanna sell stuff to. Instead, they're people. If, you, if a designer, an innovator, a business person uh, called people people, then you will design something that creates happiness for the people, something that is meaningful for them, something that creates uh, something useful and engaging. That's, you know, if you look at people. If you call them consumers, the first priority will be to sell them stuff. 
I love, for instance, as we're talking, you know, in, uh, in, uh, in, you are, many of you are in Minneapolis, I love how Target called them guests. Great, you know, what is a guest? It's somebody you wanna cherish, you wanna, you, you wanna respect, you wanna celebrate, you wanna make feel comfortable and welcome. Yes, yes, that's the way we need to look at people and we need to love them. This idea of love is powerful. It should be noted that Judy Bell is here. <laughs> a target notable. Uh, yes, that was great. That was exceptional. I, and, and also, uh, my friend Greg Van Bellinger somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> I know, all these faces. This is great. Uh, I was going to comment on the fact that yes, the, the the notable thing about James's thing was he used human in everything. He did not use consumer, which is mm -hmm. we definitely believe in strongly and is in our book, um, The Physics of Brand, because. Right, it's 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 one dimensional. It's shallow. It's a very sad way to look at people. It's also a piece of language that, if you could remove something from the corporation, remove the word consumer. Try not using that in any organization. It's not easy to do. From people I've talked to, and even just writing about it, it's not an easy thing, but an important thing to do for sure. You find yourself looking for replacements all over the place. Um, we have an incredible number of questions coming in <laughs> on the side that I can't keep up with, which is great. Um, so I, I want to, um, maybe there's another one, Kelly, that you want to ask of your set of questions or, um, you know, um, yes, I, I, I do actually. And this is just a more personal question in terms of, um, Samara, you're obviously in the epicenter, this pandemic in New York and what you're seeing. And, and James, I want to touch on obviously your experiences from the past, but for both of you, um, can you just give us a little perspective of some of the, um, positive things that you're seeing um, there in New York specifically um, as we're making our way through this new and challenging time. I mean, there's some positive stories that are obviously coming out of this experience. And I'm just curious what you've witnessed firsthand, Mara, that you could share. Well, but something positive that I'm seeing, especially for us as design community, is how people are using creativity and design to help and support in many different ways. Uh, from very early on, you know, people that will start to design and create visors and then masks. And in Italy, they use 3D printing to, to build these valves for the respirators. Uh, uh, or in the world of graphic design and brand design, using design mm -hmm. in communication to build awareness, to inform, you know, is much easier and more compelling to read a message that is graphically done in the right way that attracts you, that catch your attention versus, you know, something written on Times New Roman on a white page uh, that you receive. So the power of design in so many ways, from communication to creating solutions for people has been something uh, really, really amazing. In general, you know, I, I live in New York. Uh, I'm from Italy that where you know, the second country after China where everything started. And I have a team of 30 designers in China, led, by the way, by an Italian uh, that helped me somehow filtering and connecting with the local culture. So everything started there. And it was interesting for me to, you know, I realized very, very early on what was happening because of my team there. And also because there was an Italian there. So I, I wouldn't fall into the trap of thinking, well, Chinese, they're different. No, I had an Italian living in China for 15 years, leading my team there, and a team of Chinese under him. Under him. So I realized how the danger of the situation right away. I tried through my social media to inform, you know, Italy. Obviously, I am a drop in the ocean. <laughs> I couldn't succeed. <laughs> Obviously, I didn't expect anything different. Uh, but then that arrived to Italy. And then here, you know, the United States and New York were like, oh, Italians, you know, these won't arrive here. Your healthcare system is a disaster. And I will post that I, actually the Italian healthcare system is the second best healthcare system in the world after the French one, according to the World Health Organization. So I was like, be careful with your bias and your stereotypes because it's getting here. And my girlfriend, my fiance was in Fashion Week in Milan and she came back. And thank God, PepsiCo knew that my, she was there and they asked me not to come to work. This was uh, end of February, around the 20th of February, uh, because of the, you know, the pandemic in Italy. But even in Italy, it was just starting. Fashion Week happened. You know, they, did, they stopped it at the end. So PepsiCo stopped me from going to work. 
And then I, I would see everybody didn't care. Thousands of people came back from, it, from Italy uh, and from France, because then there was Fashion Week in Paris, and they started to spread the virus all around the United States. And New York, with the density of people we have, it's, you know, it was it, obviously two weeks later, it got crazy. And so why I'm telling this story, starting with China? Because I think it's always useful to step back and try to put things in perspective, to look at other geographies, other cultures, other communities, you know, now generalize, you know, in design, in anything we do, diversity, the richness of diversity, looking at people with different kind of backgrounds uh, that can offer different point of views, different experiences. Also looking at the past, Tuchidide, the historian, the philosopher Tuchidide used to say, you need to study the past to understand the present and forecast the future. I have a beautiful book in, uh, you know, that I keep in my living room, you know, in front of me every day, uh, that is, um, I don't remember the title, but essentially is a report on the pandemia of the 1918, uh, the, the Spanish flu. And it's amazing, you know, there is tons of pictures and you see all the pictures very similar to uh, things that you're seeing right now. Um, billboards saying the theaters are closed for the order of the mayor. Uh, you see a uh, baseball player with the mask. They play with the mask. You see socializing with the mask. You, it, it's exactly what's going on right now. So again, history or diversity today could be a very interesting way to look at everything that's going on right now. And I will leave you with two sort of lesson that, you know, for myself, you know, that I, something that I'm observing. One, the aggressive measures that China took uh, by using technology, like QR code to, for tracing their, uh, you know, the spread of the virus, you know, each person in China has a QR code. And so through that, they know who you have been in touch to, so with. And so if you get sick, they will know who else got sick cameras around the, the, the country, you know, through an aggressive approach, in two months, they got rid of the virus. Right now, life is back to normal in China. Economy is rising. Uh, the luxury industry, for instance, is growing 30%. It's just insane. My team is out there in the clubs. They go dance in the night. They go to restaurants. So obviously, China is not a democracy. It's a different kind of situations. But I tell you, I will give up my freedom that by the way is my freedom to spread the virus because it's nothing else for two months you know if i have the guarantee that after two months i i go back in control you know having a qr code that ch that trace where i am so that if i'm spreading the virus we can stop it and we can start the economy again if we don't we will we'll have a major problem and so uh, this is china and then the pandemic of 1918 life went back to normal you know restaurants open again the stadium open again everything so there are many things we are social animals in the middle of the maslow pyramid you know we know that our needs immediately after safety and our physiological need we need to connect with others we need to love to connect so technology will help us but we need also the physical connection we will go back to normal in that this virus will be you know over through vaccines, through new technologies, or just through herd immunization. So in, in that way, I'm very positive and very optimistic. Thank you. That's great. And a little bit passionate about it. I love that Maslow came up in that, in the middle of that. That was great. That was wonderful. Um, very appropriate. <laughs> James, do you have any uh, closing thoughts? Uh, we're getting towards the end of our time that we've, uh, we've asked of, of the two of you. So. Um, at the end of this, I want to give a little bit of promo for the next ones, next speeches coming up and next events, but do you have something else to share, other thoughts? Uh, there's an old saying, and I've been at this for a very long time, and I am still learning. And I still believe that my best work is in front of me, not behind me. And the thing that um, inspires me and uh, keeps my hopes high because I am also a desperate optimist. No matter what we face, I live in that space all the time. George S. Kaufman was a fantastic playwright on Broadway. And this kind of sums it up for me. If you really believe in something, you must 
stand for it, even if you have to stand alone. Those are my words, not his. His words are, if you stick around long enough, they will build a theater around you. We have to be determined to stand in what we believe. Having grown up in a business world as a right brain ambassador in that left brain world of business, my crusade is all about understanding the humanity of people. And that has got to be first and foremost. I also believe that soft skills get hard results. And design, the design economy has proven that. And I'll lend with some economic results, and I hope that you understand that this is not just about creation. This is creation for the greater good of people. And that we are all in this together. And that there needs to be more humanity in business. And these soft skills have created such a great design economy. And we have the statistics to prove it. In 2003, Motive Strategies was commissioned to create design criteria in companies. What is a design-centric culture? What does that look like? They went to the S&P after they developed the criteria set, and they could only find 75 companies that fit the criteria. After 10 years, in April of 2014, the Harvest Business Review came out with its findings. And design-centric cultures outperformed the S&P 500 by 228%. The recent study, which is a rolling 10-year study, shows that it is holding strong at 211%. This is not a coincidence. Design makes life better. We can figure out these problems because we are the ones that created them. So now is our time to step up and create new opportunities that come from these new behaviors because we're not going back to business as usual. And I'll leave you with this. If any company that you know is living in a space called business as usual, I know for a fact the next step is chapter 11.